We are back in our study on 1 Corinthians from a three-week hiatus. Some of you might have thought that we were finished with this, uh, this book, probably wishing we were some of the topics that we've covered um, over the, pa- the previous months. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to finishing up these last two chapters, and we've got some really good news in uh, this chapter today, chapter 15, is a really important chapter. So I think we're having some problems with the, the slides, unfortunately, today. Um, so uh, I'll have that available for you after the, the, um, on the website if you want to get the slides for that. Um, so yeah. What we find uh, in these previous chapters, for maybe if you haven't been with us, maybe you've forgotten um, where we've come from, is the Corinthian believers, they were struggling with living in between. They were struggling with living in between the worldly city that they were a part of, the wayward culture, the wrong relationships that they had. Have you ever felt like you're maybe living in between something? in a similar place. You know, this city is full of people living in between something. And you might be here uh, in Berlin because you're going to school. You might be studying. You might be thinking, man, if I could just get through this degree and just move on, if I could just get a job, then everything would be better. And then those of you that are currently working in jobs and have for the past 1,000 days are, are saying the exact same thing. Man, if I could just get out of this job, this place that I'm in, and get to the next place, then everything would be better. And some of you might be in a, a really tough stage of life today. Yeah, and looking out into our crowd today, we have some with little ones at home. Uh, you're not sleeping much. I can see your bloodshot eyes today. And you might be saying, man, if I could just get out of this stage, get to the next one, then things would be okay. Life tends to be full of uncomfortable moments. And many times we think that if we can just get to the comfortable place, then things will get better. But then we get to this new place, and it may be more comfortable, there may be less stress, but we still find that something is missing. We still feel like we're in between where we are now and where we really want to be. And many times this gives way to discouragement or maybe complacency. We feel like, man, if we could just get out of this. I think that what we find is that even in these comfortable places, satisfaction can be tough to find. We think that staking our hope on grasping that next piece of the pie that we're after will bring contentment. But once again, we're just left empty. Because contentment, I believe, isn't found in the comfortable place. It's not found in getting to that greener pasture. We think that we can chase contentment down by moving into a new place. But then we get to that new place, we still fail to grasp what it is that we're really after. So we chase something else in the hopes that that will bring us true joy and satisfaction. So whether you realize it or not, we are all living in between something. That we all have a tendency to chase after things that will either bring us joy or will not. And this is the reality. And we're going to develop this idea more today, what it means to live in between. Solomon once wrote this, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that was done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. The wisdom of Solomon tells us that finding our hope in anything on this earth will always lead to striving after the wind, to living in futility. We could say to living without a purpose. And I'm pretty sure that uh, no one here today wants to live in futility. So then how can we live for a purpose instead of chasing after futile things? We find that our identity and our worth is in the things we pursue. And if you haven't noticed uh, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he's meant to reveal what it is that is at the center of the, the identity of the Corinthian church. 
And the more we look at uh, this letter, the more we realize how Paul is writing to those in between. They're struggling with their identity. And what are they looking to? What are they trying to find their identity in? Well, we see they've been looking at their gifts, how they're able to, to, to speak, how they're able to prophesy. They're looking to their gifts to find their identity. They're defining their identity by their sexuality, that this is the most important thing to them, and it's going to guide how they interact with others. They're relating to everyone maybe based on how they're eating, how they eat compared to how someone else eats. Their status, whether they're slave or free, they find their identity in this, in their relationships, in, in their marriage, in their relationships inside and outside the church. They're slowly returning to their previous feudal ways. But Paul knows that this isn't in keeping with their identity. And Paul agrees with Peter in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, where Peter says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. It's because of Christ that we are no longer subject to futility, that our new identity actually breaks us free from living without a purpose, because this life has become more about the life that is coming than this life that we're in. Ultimately, what we see um, and what we have found in these chapters, chapters 3 through 14, is that the Corinthian believers are having an identity crisis. And we find one thing that is driving their identity issues, and it's pride. Pride is always the culprit of a wayward identity. Paul has been providing evidence that the Corinthian believers are returning to their feudal ways. And he knows this because he knows their words and actions are revealing what they're holding central to their identity. And what we hold central to our identity will frame what we practice. Chapters 3 through 14, these in-between chapters, are all about how we can practice our faith in light of our identity. And the Corinthian believers, they've drifted from this idea, that the, the identity that they have confessed in Jesus Christ. Now, we must be careful to, to see uh, these chapters for what they really are. Paul here, he's addressing here issues of sanctification, not justification. He's not trying to bring Corinthian believers salvation into question, but to encourage them on to maturity, to help them understand that they are not only being saved, but they are being saved. We also learn a lot about uh, Paul's intentions here, I believe, from this letter by looking at how he's constructed this letter. And uh, I really enjoy writing. I really enjoy understanding how to construct a well-reasoned argument. And I believe Paul, he gives us a master class here of how we can do this. His construction of the letter helps us understand how his theology is informing his practice. Paul reminds the Corinthian believers, and I believe he's reminding us as well, that we are living between two events that shape our identity, two theological truths that inform the practice of our faith. And if you remember back to chapter 2, you'll remember what Paul framed this letter with. It's the event that has brought us into this new in-between. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is encountering Christ on the cross that starts us down the path to understanding our new identity. It is the cross that works to subdue our pride, to bring a work by the Holy Spirit to change us into the image of our Savior. In fact, John Calvin sees that the main theme of chapters 3 through 14 is the subduing of pride. What we see is that the work of sanctification is the work of subduing pride. It's this progressive work that shapes a humble mind by seeking to remove pride in our own work and placing it in Christ's work. And I remind you of what Christ said in regard to the way of the cross in Luke 9.23. He said, To all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the way of Christ. Through Christ's death, we see a new way of life, a life that leads not to pride and selfishness, but to forgiveness and grace. 
But what we find in 1 Corinthians is that Paul doesn't stop here. In fact, the, the message of the gospel would be incomplete if we proclaim just the cross. Remember, we're living in between. There's something else that frames this momentary existence of our life. And what we find in chapter 15 is the rest of the story. Karl Barth wrote in a letter to a fellow theologian in 1919 that this chapter, chapter 15, is a key to the entire letter. And many would say that chapter 15 is one of the most important uh, chapters in all of Scripture. Matthew Henry wrote in his commentary um, of this chapter, Christ's death and resurrection are the sum and substance of evangelical truth. And it's here that in chapter 15 that we find the single most important event in the history of mankind, the resurrection of Christ that leads to the resurrection of the dead. It's the key that gives meaning to the whole story. It's the event that our faith hinges on, but also the event that the Corinthian believers were struggling with. Most of our Bible titled this uh, chapter, The Resurrection of Christ. It's Paul's defense of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. So you'll notice that uh, with the end of chapter 14, we have moved now from practical issues to, once again, a theological issue. Now, many times we think of the, the resurrection as a, an event that maybe we consign to Easter. You might be thinking it's odd that we're talking about the resurrection in this fall season, this time of year. But it is the resurrection that gives hope to Christ's atoning death. It is the resurrection that is a key evidence to the case for Christ. And I use this term case because I what we, think what we find here in this chapter is the evidence that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to save. And uh, many of you may have heard of a man named Lee Strobel. He wrote a book called The Case for Christ. Uh, I really recommend you read this book if you haven't already. But he said this about the resurrection. The resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It's the proof of his triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. It's the basis of Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. The resurrection makes clear the identity of Christ and those who will follow after Christ and be raised to life. It's the climax of our story. It frames our existence. It declares that life is more about the story that God is writing than the story that we think that we are writing. Our lives on this earth for those who find themselves in Christ is framed between the cross and the resurrection. And in fact, I would argue that without the cross and the, and the, the resurrection, then life doesn't find purpose or meaning. That the cross and the resurrection mark a new way that lays your life down for others. It tells us to step back from our own opinions, to bear with one another in love, to, to build one another up. That through Christ and his willingness to stay on the cross, that he has gained redemption by his blood. That we are now able to forgive others because Christ has forgiven us. But what if Christ has stayed in the tomb? Will we still have a gospel message? And I believe that what we find today in our text is that without the resurrection, we believe in vain. Our message today is about the gospel. Now, some of you might say, oh boy, here we go again, talking about the gospel. Do we have to talk about the gospel so much? And my question is, do we really talk about the gospel enough? I mean, we talk about it on Sundays. Do we talk it during, about it during the week? If we truly understand the magnitude of what Christ has done, we should never get tired of hearing this old, old story. We should never get tired of understanding about the, the one who has made redemption on our behalf. I think this begs us to ask another question. If we're tired of hearing the message, then do we really know what the gospel is? Last year, we posed this question to the men in our church at one of our men's meetings. We invited them to come prepared to discuss uh, what the gospel is. And we got to our meeting, we talked about uh, who God is. We talked about how he created us, the, the fall of humanity, how we're all sinners. We talked about God's story for mankind. And these are all good things. These are all important things to understand, to give context to what we believe. But are these things really the gospel? When we present these things, are we presenting the gospel? And I would say no. 
And I believe what we find in our text today is that Paul would too. So once again, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to focus on the first 11 verses of this text today. Let's pray just real quick before we dig into this text. Lord, thank you for this time. And Lord, would you open our minds, would you reveal truth to us today by the power of your Holy Spirit? It's only through your grace that we can understand. So would you help us understand today, Lord? In your name we pray, Jesus, amen. So Paul begins by saying in verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what we find in these opening verses is Paul reminding the Corinthian believers of the faith that they have believed and how they have come to know the gospel. He tells them what faith is, that faith is how we believe and is this faith that we believe in. We find in verses 1 the substance of faith, how Paul sees this process of salvation. We see in these four key verbs in verses 1 and 2 um, how he helps us understand and how faith happens. Look with me in verse 1 and 2. It says, faith happens when the gospel is preached, when it's received. It is that which you stand, and is that by which you are being saved. So we can see that the proclamation of God's word, when it is preached, brings comprehension. That we understand, we receive this message and understand it. And comprehension brings justification. It's that in which we stand. It's what our hope is. And justification brings sanctification. It's that that is, is helping us, is making us be saved. So we see this cascading cause effect of the gospel, how the gospel saves, how it establishes faith, but how it also enables faith as well. And what we find is that Paul is being absolutely clear about what faith is. Now, as we continue in our text, uh, we see his words come with a warning. Notice with me at the end of verse 2, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. What does Paul mean by this? Now, some would seek to imply with a statement that our faith is not secure, that one could believe the gospel and then fall away, that it's our job to persevere. To say, thanks, Holy Spirit, for the justification uh, for this message that I've received and, and have believed, but now I'm going to take it from here. And let me remind you that you cannot persevere on your own. That it is only by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit that you can hold fast to the word of truth. And for those struggling with doubting your salvation today, don't forget Paul's words in Ephesians 1. Look at uh, verse 13 with me. I hope... Oh, good, we got it going up there on the screen, good. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. That if you have heard the word of truth and believed, then you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and your inheritance is guaranteed. And notice how the German text communicates the result of being healed with the Holy Spirit. It says, Dieser Geist ist die Ansalung auf unser Erbe und die Garantie für die vollständige Erlösung seines Eigentums. Your belief in the gospel seals you with the Holy Spirit, and it predetermines that you will acquire your redemption in full, that your present and future reality is that you are his possession. That is good news. So what does Paul mean, unless you believed in vain? We haven't answered that question yet. And I believe his desire is to remove any doubt about what it is that we're setting our hope on. And Paul, he knows that our behavior indicates one of two things, that we've either drifted from our gospel identity like the, the Corinthians have, or we have not understood the magnitude of the gospel and have put our hope in something else. Paul knows that behavior reflects the thing we're holding central to our identity. 
And when we fully comprehend the power of the Spirit and how it works in us in the gospel message, then we will be determined to stand on it. We will not just have knowledge of it. And there's a difference between being acquainted with what God's Word says and believing it, staking our hope on what God's Word says. 2 Timothy 3 uh, verse 15 says this, From childhood you have been acquainted with, sac- with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It's one thing to have knowledge of God's Word. It's another thing to, to, to stand on it. There's one thing to be acquainted with it. It's another thing to believe it, to believe this message that makes you wise and brings salvation. And what we find is that central to how we live in between is the issue of identity. And for those of you who are in Christ, all other identities will melt away as we hear, receive, and stake our hope on the gospel. Hearing the gospel preached, receiving it, and standing on it begins a new process. It begins a process where he will increase and we will decrease. And if you take your stand on any other identity... Other than Christ, you have believed in vain. Paul reminds the Corinthians of these things because they've forgotten their identity. They've forgotten that they've been confronted with the cross and are called to live in a new way. They've forgotten that they've been justified by the crucified Christ. And notice the three verbs, how they initiate our new identity. As the gospel is preached, received, and stood upon, one is justified. It is in that moment that you are declared righteous before God, a fact that can never change. As Paul says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That your past, future, and present reality is that your guilt has been removed by the work of Christ on the cross. Do you recognize what good news this is today? that those in Christ Jesus are no longer guilty before a just and holy God. And if you are standing in Christ alone, you've moved into a new in-between that is now for a purpose. You are now between the cross and the resurrection. You are called to live in a new way with a new purpose and a new identity. The believer now sees the world from a different perspective. At one time, We were living in futility, that this is all there is. This world is it. Now we're living in between what's coming, that there's more that's coming. That we're not only saved, but that we're being saved, that that we will be saved. And this is a great mystery, but one that's made clear by the gospel. Our gospel identity is that we are justified, that we are being sanctified, and that we will one day be glorified. And this is what Paul wants the Corinthian believers to remember. Their behavior should be in line with their identity. Faith happens when the gospel is preached, received, and stood upon. And because of this reality, it now has the power to sanctify us, to subdue our pride, and to bring us to maturity. Which brings us back to our question today, what is the gospel? Or what is this message that we receive unto salvation? Well, fortunately for us, this is where Paul takes us now in in our passage, and we find one of the clearest definitions in the whole New Testament in verses 3 and 4 of the gospel. It's the message, or what we believe. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So ask again, what is the gospel? Well, according to Paul, it is that Christ died for your sins. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared. Just like our faith hinges on four works of the Spirit, the message of the gospel is founded on four works of Christ. That Christ died, was buried, was raised, and appeared. This is the gospel. The early church knew this uh, message to be the kerygma, 
And it means the, the simple proclamation of the gospel is what the whole message, the whole church was built on. All other teaching, this deep theological truth that Paul's been talking about, or what the early church knew as the, um, the Didache, was what was to reinforce this message that the church was built on, the gospel message. It is the gospel Christ and his complete atoning work by which we are saved. Not just that he was crucified, but that he w- was crucified and resurrected. And this is found the foundation stone of the church. So the gospel message is about him and what he has done for us in contrast to a message about how we can be saved. It's a message that puts our hope in what he has done and not what we have done. And here's the thing. If you have believed that he died, but don't believe that he was raised, then you've believed in vain. The gospel message is incomplete with just the crucifixion. Luther said of the resurrection that one must deny in a lump the gospel and everything that is proclaimed of Christ and of God if they choose to deny the resurrection. The resurrection is the central event of all humanity that gives hope to our existence. It gives meaning to our in-between, to how we can live and love in light of the gospel. It's the resurrection that takes a catastrophe and it gives it purpose. It takes our hardship that we experience in this life. It makes sense of our suffering. J.R.R. Tolkien, you might have heard of him. He, in fact, based his whole writing career on this one idea. The idea of taking a catastrophe and turning it into what he called a eucatastrophe. Now, some of you are probably saying, what are you talking about, a eucatastrophe? But this idea was laid out in an article I recently read um, from the BBC. And I want to read a couple excerpts from this. I think it gives context to what we're talking about today. It says, according to Tolkien, a eucatastrophe in a story often happens at the darkest moment. When all seems lost, when the enemy seems to have won, a sudden joyous turn for the better can emerge. It delivers a deep emotional reaction in readers, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart. This idea comes from an essay about fairy stories, he wrote, in the early 1940s, and why such stories matter. Based on a lecture he had delivered in Scotland, has not only defined and shaped his view as a fantasy writer, but would prove influential for years to come. Fairy stories, Tolkien argued, are not only meant for children. Such tales have purpose that nourishes the heart and mind, he continued. They can help us to remember and recover what may have been lost or taken for granted. They offer escape from one world to another, and ultimately, they bring consolation and the reassurance that there can be happy endings. In The Hobbit, it's be the sudden arrival of the eagles in the battle of the five armies. The return of Gandalf at the moment that all seems lost in the two towers. While on the return of the king is the moment that Gollum unexpectedly falls into the cracks of Mount Doom, destroying the one ring. And listen to this. For Tolkien himself, a Christian, the ultimate human example was the life of Jesus, his birth and eventual resurrection. He once wrote, there is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true. The resurrection gives us the eucatastrophe of our human existence. It snatches victory from the jaws of defeat, life from the chains of death. It's meant to remind us, like Paul is doing, to recover what we may have lost sight of or taken for granted. It's a call to realign our hearts and our minds according to the gospel message that we have believed. The resurrection gives meaning to the cross. It says that we can withstand this light and momentary affliction because we know it will not compare to the glory that is coming because Christ has risen and we will rise too. So like Tolkien said, no tale has ever been told that men would rather find was true. And my question for you today is, do you find it to be true? Do you believe the evidence? So we've seen Paul present the faith how we believe. We've seen him uh, present the message, what we believe. And now we see him present the evidence, why we believe. And we believe the gospel message because the gospel confirms Christ's death and resurrection.
Notice in verse, uh, verses 4 and 5 of our text how the gospel message gives evidence to the crucifixion and the resurrection. It says that he died and was buried, that he was raised and he appeared. His death and resurrection, these first and third verbs, they give meaning and confirm the facts that he was buried and that he appeared. We can be sure of this because of what Christ has done. We can be sure of this because the prophets and the apostles speak to his death and resurrection. It says, according to the scriptures or according to the prophets, the gospel message has been confirmed. The message of the gospel was foretold by the prophets and is the message spoken forth by the apostles that confirms what the prophets had said. God's word in both the Old and the New Testament speaks to the evidence that Christ died and rose again. Now, for the Corinthian believers, there was no dispute that Christ had died. In fact, you'll, you'll find no opposition, even from the enemies of Christ, that Christ has died, but that he was raised. This is where the controversy begins. But I also believe that this is where belief is born. It's a eucatastrophe of the resurrection that gives evidence to the catastrophe of Christ's crucifixion, that Christ is who he said he was. You know what happens when people believe that Christ died, but they don't believe that he was raised? They begin to doubt who he was. They doubt his deity, that he is God, that his work on the cross is sufficient to take away our sins, that the gospel doesn't have power to transform our identity and our bodies as those who will rise from the dead. Paul will spend the, the rest of this chapter presenting the evidence for Christ's resurrection and that the dead in Christ will also rise, which is why we must look at the evidence that Paul's providing today, decide whether we really believe, because the dispute about the gospel is not whether Christ died, but whether he was risen, whether he has risen. And if you remember back to uh, Acts 17, Paul is explaining the gospel to the, the men and women of Athens, and he's proclaiming the gospel to them. And what happens when he proclaims the resurrection? It says in Acts 17, starting in verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Aeropagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Critical to, the, to your belief in the gospel is your belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus that defies all scientific evidence. If you are looking to explain Christ based on the natural, you will walk away because our hope hinges on a supernatural exclamation point in the history of mankind. But even in this, the miracle of the gospel message, what we find today in our text is legitimacy for the skeptic. And Paul, he presents some profound evidence for Christ's resurrection in our, test, our, our text here, that he appeared, and because he has appeared, the eyewitnesses bear witness to his death and resurrection. And we see all those who have borne witness that Christ has appeared, starting in verse 5. Verse 5 says, And they appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though most have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. We see multiple credible accounts that confirm the resurrection of Christ. And I wish we could... Look at each of these lives that are listed here today. See how their lives were changed from this point on, but for time's sake, we won't do that. Let's just focus on two from the list of over 500 that Paul mentions. Let's talk about James, who most scholars believe to be the half-brother of Jesus. We know him as the future leader of the church of Jerusalem, but James didn't believe in Jesus. In fact, many scholars believe that it was this appearance that completely changed James' mind about who Jesus was. And you can almost sense the bitterness, can't you, with um, James relating to Jesus throughout his life. I mean, can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your older brother? Can you 
Imagine trying to outdo Jesus in being good. We don't know if James was part of the family that accused Jesus of being out of his mind in Mark chapter 3. But regardless of what James thought of Jesus, we know he was not a follower of Jesus and that he rejected that Jesus was the Messiah. I can't imagine the day Christ appeared to him. What that must have been like to know, think you know Jesus so well, but to realize how much he really didn't know him. To now be standing there encountering the risen Christ. And it's that moment that defined the rest of James' life. It's that moment that would, have, that would define his eventual death. It's the moment that James began to die to self and live to Christ. And what about Paul? He wasn't just someone who had rejected Christ, but someone who had made it his life mission to persecute his followers. A man so bold, so sure of what he believed. A man that pursued the law with such vigor, such passion, that he surpassed all others and boasted in his own self-righteousness. But now he pens these words. Look at verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it is his grace toward me that was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. What takes a man a life of pride and arrogance to a life of humility and service, from boasting in himself to now boasting only in Christ. Well, according to Paul, it's grace. It is by grace that he is what he is. It's by grace that we are what we are. It's by grace that we're saved. By grace that we are being saved. It's grace that looks at our past and offers forgiveness. Grace that looks at our strained hearts and draws us back to the truth. It's grace that enables salvation. Grace that causes faith to happen as the gospel is preached, received, stood upon, and allowed to do its saving work. And if you believe that Christ died for your sins and has risen from the grave, then grace will not let you believe in vain. Grace will hold you fast because grace encounters the worst of sinners and offers them what they don't deserve. It offers men like James reconciliation. The one who thought the savior of the world, his own brother, was a lunatic. That man has been redeemed. It offers men like Paul redemption. The one who participated in the stoning of the first saint, Stephen, he has been forgiven. It is grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the pillars of the cross and the resurrection on which the church stands. And we must believe the whole gospel. We must believe that the whole gospel is what we must preach if people are not to believe in vain. Paul ends our text today with one final piece of evidence. He says in verse 11, whether then it was I or they... So we preach, and so you believed. Have you ever realized that you are part of the evidence of Christ's death and resurrection? As the gospel was preached to you and you believed, you have become a witness to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we are here today bearing witness to the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, was raised, and appeared as evidence to the gospel message. The church is evidence to his death and resurrection. And it's Peter's confession of Christ on which the church is built. You are a testament, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Christ. So live with this purpose. Take this message to those who are living in futility. Their eternity depends on whether the gospel is preached and believed. And lastly, remember the gospel for yourself. Let the the grace of God infiltrate your life. Now, Friday morning, I was reminded by one of my favorite writers, another Paul, 
Paul Tripp to live life remembering the gospel. And I wanted to share this with you as I, I close today. I believe it sums up perfectly what Paul is saying in our passage. It says, so easy, it's so easy to be an identity amnesiac. It's so easy to forget who you are in Christ and what you have been given as his child. It's so easy to shop horizontally for what you have already been given vertically. It's so easy to give in to fear, to give way to shame, or to allow yourself to be weakened by guilt because you forget the present benefits of Jesus' finished work. So easy in the hardships of life to forget that nothing is powerful enough to separate you from God's love. It's so easy to fail to live in light of the fact that Jesus didn't die just for your past forgiveness or your future resurrection, but also for everything you are facing in the here and now, in the in-between. It's easy to forget who you are and look for identity elsewhere. So God has ordained that we should gather again and again to remember again and again who we are and what we have been given. His church is a tool of grace, a vehicle for remembering so that we may celebrate and grow. Brothers and sisters, may we grow in grace together by remembering again and again the cross and the resurrection. And may we live in love in light of the gospel in our present in-between for his glory. Lord, thank you so much for the gospel. Lord, thank you for coming. Thank you for dying. Thank you for rising again so that we can have life. It's by your grace that we are here today. Lord, would you give us the grace to take this message to our world, to our city, that they may know as well. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.